Friends, um, let me begin by uh, thanking uh, Sudhinder for uh, inviting me to give this talk uh, in this series, The Gurus of Science. And uh, let me also thank Radha for just uh, saying too many things about me. <laughs> the, la the last part you got a little wrong, but <laughs> we'll correct it later. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, uh, I think I'm a student, really, of uh, science, and I'll always be. And uh, I think uh, if you just pause to think about the, the amazing enormity of the world around you, that anything you pick around you and ask for an explanation will take you into, uh, into a... It will basically uh, reveal to you the, uh, the fact that uh, we know very little and uh, it's very likely that we'll always be students of nature. So let me just uh, begin my uh, talk by saying that, uh, as she said, I am from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research uh, and uh, we have a, a string theory group here. I'll tell you what string theory is. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, but I'll explain that to you. And this string theory group consists of some of the world's best people in the area. And uh, just last week, uh, there was a journalist in my office who asked me, what is the use of string theory for India? And uh, I didn't want to give a very detailed answer about what is the connection of basic sciences to the development of India, but I said that it is very important in India to demonstrate to the world that we can be uh, within the first five in a certain area. And I think uh, uh, in this subject, uh, I'm very happy to say that over the last quarter of a century, we have built up a group which is uh, amongst the best in the world, actually. And that I think is a very important uh, point to make that we can, if we want, uh, reach those levels uh, in spite of our uh, uh, recent history and uh, I just wanted to make this point to you before I begin my technical talk. So, uh, all right, so I was told that this talk is uh, uh, sort of between uh, 6 and 8, uh, you're already at 6.30. So, uh, uh, I just want you to relax, actually, in the sense that, you know, we are not going to do something very complicated. <laughs> and uh, uh, it will be mostly historical, and uh, we'll touch on a lot of uh, foundational aspects of, uh, uh, of the modern world, actually. Okay, so our story goes back to uh, the uh, end of the uh, 17th century in Europe, and to Galileo and Newton. I uh, just wanted to mention that uh, there could have been a slide before this, and uh, that slide would have basically uh, pointed out that uh, the device to measure time actually was perfected by Galileo. And uh, the perfection of a certain technology actually has a lot of bearing on what uh, people do in the basic and fundamental sciences. So usually we begin with Newton and talk of this uh, great work, uh, the philosophia, the philosophical principles of natural philosophy, which is considered one of the, uh, uh, perhaps one of the greatest works in the history of science, which for the first time uh, gave a certain platform or a certain uh, view of how, how to think about problems of science, actually. And I think uh, uh, it is not only a book of mechanics, but also laid down for posterity uh, entire framework within which to think. And this framework, of course, also got augmented as we went on in time, which I will talk about. So this is about the people. And uh, let me now say the following, that uh, the... Uh, so. I want to begin with the beginning of our subject. The Newton formulated the laws of motion in terms of the flow of time of coordinates of a point particle. 
You see, this uh, sounds a very trivial thing today, but to think about setting up a formulation of the description of the external world in terms of the flow of a continuous variable called time was a very important milestone in, uh, in science, philosophy, and many things, actually. So, uh, this pointer is not working. Do you have a stick by any chance, Some something more mechanical? I think there are two buttons. Uh, uh, yes. One of them is the red. So if you could try both of them. Is this working? Okay. Yeah. Yes, I think if I press it too long, then it goes away. You can try the blue one. Okay, this one. Okay, I'll manage. Don't worry. Okay. So, so this this if you want to describe the motion of some particle, like you know, like a ball or something, then you tell where it is in space and at what time it is there. And uh, one of the important tenets of Newton's theory was time is universal. Universal in the sense that uh, the time you measure here is the same as the, uh, you know, the time somebody who is moving uh, on a bicycle besides you is, uh, you know, all our watches are synchronized actually. And we sort of, you know, tell we meet at 4 o'clock. So we all arrive at 4 o'clock if we are very disciplined, but the notion of time is the same uh, for everybody and it is the same for everybody who is sort of moving at constant speeds with respect to each other. So here is a simple diagram. So what you have essentially is some frame of reference and there is a clock here. And there is another frame of reference. So there can be somebody here and somebody here. And their clocks, whatever their state of motion is, are always synchronized, provided they move with respect to each other at some constant velocity. Okay, so this is the main idea that if you are moving with respect to each other at constant velocity, you cannot make out that you are moving. For example, you must be sitting in a train many times. The train is uh, at rest, but you suddenly feel you are moving. But if you look out carefully, you will see it's the other train that's moving in the other direction. So, the frames which are related to each other by uh, constant velocities are called inertial frames. And uh, the idea is that the notion of time is the same for all of them. Something more I'd like to say is that um, the uh, so if you have this idea, then you can formulate a certain law of motion, and those are the Newton law of motion. But I will not deliberate on them. But I will just jump directly to. Uh, the law of universal gravitation, because the central subject of our lecture actually is the theory of gravity. Okay. So I have told you about the, the stage. So you have this notion of uh, inertial reference frames and the notion of time, which is the same for all observers which are moving at constant velocity with respect to each other. And so then you have Newton's laws of motion. I'm not going to write them down, but uh, uh, Newton gave a certain law of motion that the force is equal to mass times acceleration. And uh, he was mostly interested, amongst other things, in the force of gravity. Because uh, the force of gravity uh, explains uh, the falling of objects on Earth and also the falling of the moon towards the Earth. The motion of the moon is explained. And I think, you know, this. Uh, the, uh, this was, in fact, in some sense, one of the uh, first unifications of knowledge in the sense something which is a heavenly body obeys the same law as a piece of chalk actually on earth. So I think there's an enormous impact actually at this time uh, with this type of a discovery that there is nothing so heavenly about a heavenly body. It follows the same law. So that was the law of universal gravitation which uh, basically says that the force of gravity is proportional to the product of the masses of the objects which are interacting divided by the square of the distance. So this is the inverse square law, which was gleaned by Newton from the uh, work of uh, Johannes Kepler and uh, Tycho Brahe, who actually painstakingly had measured uh, 
the motion of the heavens over a period of almost uh, 35 to 40 years. There is one thing about this law which is very uh, interesting and it is uh, the fact that uh, this is an instantaneous law. Instantaneous means that uh, if you have two bodies, if one moves, instantly the other one will move. Newton was aware of the uh, problems of this type of an instantaneous interaction between bodies given by this law. Okay, all right. So now uh, the chapter on Newton's laws and the law of gravitation I have sort of discussed with you. Okay, so Newton's laws were formulated in terms of point particles. How, how point particle means you always idealize some huge object as a point particle and uh, find out uh, how it moves. This idealization is always in terms of point particles. But we know that there are many things in this world actually which are made of many particles actually, like you know, objects, balls, like uh, the flow of water, for example. So that has to do with many particles. And many particles, each one of them satisfies Newton's law. Okay? But then how do you write a law for all of them together? Okay? And that was achieved in 1822 by uh, this famous uh, French engineer, Navier. And uh, its uh, more beautiful derivation was given by Stokes. So, uh, and of course before it, uh, you have the equations of Euler in which this term was not there. But these are the so-called Navier-Stokes equation and these are the bread and butter of uh, every uh, department of aeronautical engineering, mechanical engineering. And I'll tell you later on the string theory, people are very interested in these laws also. Okay, so these are the laws of fluid mechanics. Many particles in the Newtonian framework. Okay? Now, now we make a big jump. Okay. So as time went on, mechanics actually uh, uh, was side by side followed by the discovery of the laws of electricity and magnetism. Right? It's, a, it's a big, uh, you know, all of these things are discovered by very careful, painful experiments. Okay? And then they are sort of uh, uh, encapsulated by people in this case, like Faraday and Maxwell. So Faraday introduced the idea of the lines of force of the electric and magnetic field. So he introduced the idea that there is something called the electric and magnetic field, which is there in every point of space-time. It is here. I mean, you know, you have this light. So there's a fluctuating electric and magnetic field that enables you to see the screen and so on. So this was an idea which was very important. This, of course, has very great engineering applications because this is the principle of the electric motor. But uh, I will not go into that now. But I want to mention all the time that you know science is not an isolated activity. It's an activity in which technology, experiments, society, everything is important. And nobody asked me the question, why is it that I started with Newton and Galileo in Europe? not somewhere else. That's an interesting question. Okay, so then we come to the, the towering achievement of the 19th century. And this is the photograph of James Clark Maxwell. Usually he's shown with a very big beard. And we all think that he's a very old man. But please subtract 31 from 79. And you see that actually he lived a very short life. He lived only 48 years. And he uh, he's the person who uh, gave us the first uh, important uh, what I say? unification of electricity and magnetism. So I'm always talking of unifications, you see, of things which look different, but when we understand more, they look the same. Actually. They are part of the same. So Maxwell unified electricity and magnetism, and he predicted he predicted that these equations of his have waves and he identified the electromagnetic wave with light. I mean, this, this, is, this is an amazing thing actually that uh, from the theoretical reasoning you arrive at an equation which is a wave equation, there is a wave and then from hindsight and experiment 
you say that this is this is uh, the light that you see okay and then later on it led to the famous discovery of uh, Rangan of x-rays etc okay so uh, let me say that Maxwell's discovery of the laws of electromagnetism is one of the most important discoveries of the 19th century and it eventually led to a profound revision of the Newtonian view of space and time. So the reason I introduced Maxwell was that from here starts all the trouble which uh, led Einstein to uh, formulate his special theory of relativity. So where are we? We started with Newton. We had a certain notion of time that events are simultaneous for observers that move at constant velocity with respect to each other. And then we arrive at Maxwell's equations and the speed of light. The speed of light is finite. That is the point. It is not only finite, but it happens to be the same for all observers who are moving at constant speed relative to each other. So these are the two important things which the Maxwell theory gave you. Let me repeat it. That the speed of light is finite. Okay. And secondly, the speed of light doesn't change. See, if I am, if I, if there is a, if there is a person standing here and walking, and you know, you go on an escalator in the airport, right? And then an escalator, and there is a path that doesn't move. So there are people walking on both, right? So the escalator is moving. So there's a relative velocity between the two, right? So of course, I mean, you know, I go much faster than the guy who is walking at the same speed, right? Because the escalator speed is added on to me. So there's an addition of velocity law, okay? This addition of velocity law breaks down when we talk about light. The speed of light will be the same on the escalator and outside the escalator. So these are two of the most important tenets and in fact, this is the whole story of the special theory of relativity of Einstein, actually. The rest is mathematical stuff, but this is it. Huh? So, moment you say that the speed of light is finite, it means that simultaneity, you know, events which are simultaneous for one observer are not simultaneous for a moving observer. So that is the end of simultaneity and this is the, this is the end of the Newtonian paradigm in theoretical physics that... Uh, has been brought about by the discovery of Maxwell. But it's Einstein who realized the far-reaching implications of this uh, discovery and uh, set it forth in his uh, special theory of relativity. So now I have a little bit of a thing to explain to you, which is elementary stuff. And this is actually from the original paper on the special theory of relativity. More or less, this is the argument. Let's do it. So he's a rocket, OK? There's an astronaut here, and uh, there is somebody standing, observing the rocket. Now, the rocket has a device, okay, to measure time. So time is measured by essentially a flash going off here, reflecting from a mirror, and being observed over here. Yeah. That's one unit of time, okay? Now see what happens, based on what I told you. With respect to her, this ship is moving, right? That means since the velocity of light is finite, obviously light will take a longer path than this. Really? The next step is tricky, but just believe me, that because the velocity of light is the same for here and here, which is very counterintuitive, you will arrive at a simple formula which says that Time goes slower for her than for him. For the simple reason that uh, light takes a longer path. So between so the between this tick and this, which is also a tick, there is a difference. So uh, time intervals measured by this observer will be longer than measured by this astronaut. And uh, this formula is very striking. It says that when v is nearly the speed of light, you will see the difference. If very small v, you don't see the difference. And then you get Newton's mechanics. Delta t prime is equal to delta t. But it's another thing about science, you know. 
that uh, whatever new you discover has to be always consistent with whatever you know before. You know, so so this actually defines this discipline. Okay, this way of looking at knowledge. Okay. So I just wanted to tell you that this is one of the important and simple consequences of the special theory of relativity. Okay, now, now I have been talking to you about uh, you know people moving with respect to each other at constant velocity. Okay. So clearly, I mean, Einstein asked himself a question: What if they accelerate? You know, what is the new law? Okay. What is the new law? He also at the same time had another question burning in his mind that if the velocity of light is finite, what happens to Newton's law of gravity? Because that was instantaneous. You see, if something moves here, it will take some time to reach here and tell this fellow to move. That doesn't happen. So there is a problem with the theory of gravity of Newton already. And there is also, on the other hand, the issue of accelerating the constraints. And what Einstein did basically is that he realized that these two issues are related to each other. And uh, this is of course the great crowning glory of the general theory of relativity. So now let me explain the happiest thought. Okay, What is the happiest thought? The happiest thought is called the principle of equivalence. And uh, let me just explain this to you. Uh, <clears throat> So this is in 1907, okay. 1905, the special theory of relativity, 1907, is this. So it says that the effect of a constant gravitational field is equivalent to a uniformly accelerated frame. So let me just explain this to you. So here you see on this side of the diagram, just like we, you know, standing on Earth, and uh, near the uh, surface of the Earth, the the gravitational field is a constant, right? Because the radius of the Earth is far away, so there is no gravitational field of the Earth. But we are in a rocket, and the rocket is accelerating. Okay? It is accelerating exactly in such a way that for a small time, the acceleration is identical to this number g. And uh, now again, this person over here will release the ball. Okay? So there is a way of looking at it, if I am from the outside, okay, if I am the omnipresent observer, I will say, aha, he left the ball, the ball is just there, but the rocket moved towards it, right? Okay. Now, the statement of the principle of equivalence is that there is no experiment actually you can perform in which you can differentiate between this situation and this situation. That is the principle of equivalence. So, uh, now let me, uh, is it clear that this is the principle? It's not clear. Let me, let me, let me go to the next transparency then. Okay. So, before I read out to, this, to you this uh, quotation from Einstein, uh, let me uh, explain to you in slightly more, uh, slightly different terms. Uh, when you go to work every morning and you sit in a bus and the bus breaks, what happens to you? You fall forward, right? You fall forward, right? And your neighbor falls forward exactly the same, even though he's fat or thin or whatever. That's the point. All of you fall in the same way when the bus breaks. Because now somebody will say, aha, it's decelerating. So, uh, you know, the, it's the bus that is decelerating, but you are just there. So that is, so that's a phenomenon you are familiar with. You are also familiar with the phenomenon of falling down once in a while by tripping, right? So all I am trying to tell you is that these two effects are identical. That was the big realization. That gravity can be understood in terms of accelerating frames. That is the principle of equivalence. And this is the happiest thought of his life. So let me quote, now it came to me. The fact of the equality of inert and heavy mass, that is the fact of the independence of the gravitational acceleration of the nature of the falling substance, may be expressed as follows. In a gravitational field of small spatial extension, things behave 
as they do in a space free of gravitation. If one introduces in it, in place of an inertial system, a reference system which is accelerated relative to an inertial system. Whatever is said here is what I've explained to you. Okay. I, I said many things to you. You sit and your neighbor who's a bigger man sits, but both of you fall in the same way. That's the point where he says that uh, the acceleration is independent of the object, its mass. That was a famous experiment of Galileo, remember, from the Leaning Tower of Pisa? That's the point, actually. So that experiment is being interpreted now, that was in terms of, you know, gravity is interpreted in terms of an accelerating frame. So the gravitational field can be nullified by an accelerating frame. That is the principle of gravity. So that's what it is. All right. So this is the happiest thought. Then, after the happiest thought, there is this incredible struggle from 1907 to 1915. I, I had the uh, privilege of, uh, of uh, editing a volume uh, celebrating the 1905 works of Einstein, in which I, uh, I, I studied a lot about Einstein's life. And uh, you realize that this is one of the one of the most intense struggles, actually, to uh, understand something that uh, what is the connection between gravitation and accelerating frames. So I cannot, I would have loved to explain this to you, but there is no time to do that. But from this understanding, Einstein arrived at his famous law of gravity. And the famous law of gravity is as follows, okay? Uh, it's, a, it's a great pity I can't explain to you, but uh, what can we do? <laughs> I'm, I'm missing that uh, pointer. pointer. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, so now let me explain to you what is the essence of the equations Einstein arrived at from this simple thought. So you remember that you have a trampoline, you know, people do exercises on it or some, uh, you know, very malleable piece of plastic and uh, you put a heavy object on it. What will happen is that you will sort of distort this nice plane looking thing. You know, there will be a distortion of the fabric, okay? <coughs> so what Einstein said is that if you have a heavy mass, it will distort the fabric of space-time. It will distort the coordinate systems actually that you use to describe the phenomenon in space time. Okay. So clocks and rulers become plastic, malleable, okay, like a rubber sheet. Okay. That's what he said. And then if you have, for example, uh, a light object like a ping pong ball, you remember? Then you leave it here, it will just fall straight, right? And if you take the ping pong ball and spin it around, it's given some motion around, some angular momentum, momentum. it'll just stay in this orbit. And once it loses its velocity, it'll just comb down into where the <coughs> depression is maximum. So this is the picture, this is only a picture, okay, of Einstein's law of gravity. So the fabric of space-time is described by what is called the metric of space-time, means some function that tells you the distances between points, for example, you have a piece of rubber, okay? I mean, look at this. I mean, the distance between two points over here and here would be different. And the mathematical description of this difference is encapsulated in something called the metric of space-time. And Einstein's equations are written in terms of this metric of space-time. These are the famous Einstein equations. I just wanted to flash them so that you see at least what these equations look like. And they are written in the language of geometry. And so you have a geometric understanding of gravity. And from here, as I said before, you should be able to derive Newton's theory for small velocities. And that is possible. And in fact, that is the thing that took him the longest to arrive at. Because in the beginning, he was missing this term. And if you miss this term, you don't get the right Newton law. Work can work for years and you sort of discover this. And so in 1915, these equations were ready. Okay. 
So what you take home with you is that Einstein's theory, this is called a general theory because it is not special frames but general frames related to each other. Einstein's theory talks about the fabric of space-time. Okay. That's the important thing. And how the fabric of space-time is twisted and turned by matter and uh, the law of gravity basically is the response of something else to that twisting and turning. So that gets rid of instantaneous uh, interaction that gets rid of all the problems of Newtonian theory and you have really, I mean, one of the great achievements of the human mind, the uh, theory, general theory of relativity. Now, this is not just uh, equations, okay? This has tremendous consequences. And uh, before I tell you the, the deeper consequences, let me... Uh, let, let, let me, after this slide, tell you something which uh, will really hearten you. Uh, so, now this theory got tested experimentally. Okay? So, it's very important that this theory is experimentally tested. And in fact, uh, there is a very beautiful episode that uh, Arthur Eddington actually went to Africa to you know, observe the, uh, uh, the uh, solar eclipse to make an experiment to test this theory. And... Uh, Einstein was very anxious, but he said that if this theory is wrong, then God would have missed a great opportunity. <laughs> That's what he said. Anyway, so it all works out. The uh, bending of starlight is there in the Einstein theory. What that means is that if you have, uh, if you have a, let's see, if you have this big object over here, and uh, if you have a star behind it, okay, then uh, the star gives out light. Light is energy, energy is attracted, and therefore you have bending. There's no, no blackboard here, this is a big problem actually. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, let me do the following. So you imagine this is the sun, okay? And there's a star behind, okay? And it's giving out light. Now the light of the star, you will not be able to see usually, right? Because you're here. Now what happens is that this light bends. There's a lensing effect because of this huge gravitating object. So you will see the star here and here. This measurement works out identical to what the general theory of relativity predicts. And so it's a very important test of general theory of relativity. The other important uh, prediction of the general theory of relativity is the precision of the orbit of Mercury. You see, we have the Sun. Mercury um, is going around the Sun. So there's an orbit like this. But this orbit is actually precessing and the precession is 43 seconds of an arc in a century. It's a very tiny effect and Einstein theory got it completely right. The Newton theory gives half the answer but the Einstein theory got it completely right. So this is the, the uh, perihelion. And then much later in the 1970s, Hulse and Taylor discovered an extraordinary effect actually which uh, also verified the Einstein theory. I won't elaborate because if I start to elaborate on everything, we'll be here till midnight. <laughs> so, all right. Besides all this, besides all this, and what I'm going to tell you now, what this theory really does for you, I wanted to tell you that next time when you travel and you have this uh, global positioning system, I just wanted to say that the accuracy of your knowledge of where you are uses the general theory of relativity. It corrects, it corrects the, uh, the uh, slowing down of time, which is measured by those satellites, compared to time over here, because we are in a gravitational field. So, uh, you know, clocks are faster here than there. And this correction is very important to give uh, accurate uh, uh, reading on your telephone instrument in the global position. This is sort of a little mundane, but it's modern technology. I just wanted to tell you the general theory of relativity is not only used to understand the universe, but also to, you know, it has a practical application over here. Okay, now we come to the main point. What does it really do for you? It provides a framework for the Big Bang model of the universe. In fact, I forgot to show you something, but I...
actually got a balloon. So now if some some kid can volunteer to blow it, I'll ask my own son. <laughs> okay, this this object is what the universe looks like uh, in a certain experiment which is called the Wilkinson microwave and isotropic probe. Uh, this is one of the uh, most important uh, images of our universe. This is how the universe looked 300,000 years after it was created in the Big Bang. This is the picture of it actually. And what you see over here are all these bright and non-bright spots which tell you about the temperature differences okay, <clears throat> that you measure by this probe. Now, what is this temperature business actually? So let me just go to the next. Uh, I just wanted to tell you this. This is, hey, you have to know this because this is one of the greatest stories of our times actually. So what is this picture? This picture is a cartoon of our universe. Okay. This is the beginning. That is what we don't know much about. This is where string theory is supposed to hopefully take care of what physics is over here. So we come to, many things happen over here. We come to this era. This era is approximately 300,000 years after this so-called Big Bang, whatever it is. Okay. Now, the temperature of the universe at this point was approximately 3000 degrees centigrade. Okay. Why? Contrast. And then the universe expands. Okay. The universe expands, matter is created, galaxies are created, you and I are created. It's amazing. This is, a, this is, the, this is where we are here. This is where physics, chemistry, biology. Remember Lenz? Lenz showed the same diagram. But uh, he also had the uh, Gary Tinker over here, and he had uh, chemistry, and biology, complex systems in a cooler universe. If the universe is very hot, you cannot have a complex system because it just split apart. So, this is the picture. We know this picture. This is a measurement. This is the truth. And what you see these uh, little uh, bumps over here are the bumps which eventually became the galaxies and the stars and all the matter that you see around you. <coughs> and there's a brilliant description of this story in a book by Simon Singh called The Big Bang. I really recommend that book to you. Okay, so I wanted to make this point that the Einstein theory of general relativity is a good theory that explains all a lot of this phenomenon. You know, so it's 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 a framework within which you understand the large universe actually, okay? large distances. So it's a very important and correct theory, okay? All the way from here to here. In fact, very much below here also. So that's a different story, but uh, here is another picture of the same. It's a cartoon. And I, as I was mentioning to you that uh, it's around the temperatures of uh, 3000 degrees Kelvin centigrade is more or less the same that uh, the uh, cosmic microwave background radiation became loose and today the temperature is something like uh, 3 degrees Kelvin or minus 272 point something degrees centigrade. So this was the big discovery of Penzias and Wilson that they found that there is this omnipresent radiation in the sky which is cold. And they discovered it because they were engineers trying to develop antennas at Bell Labs. They could not get rid of this stuff. And, uh, and I think they were talking to people at Princeton University, Robert Dickey and all that. And then I think people concluded that this must be the cosmic, the glow of the universe actually. The glow of the universe at this time. And it came from a universe which was very hot over here. Below this we cannot see anything for reasons I will not discuss. We cannot see anything but we have a very good theory that goes all the way till here. It's here that we do not know the theory very well. Okay. 
So what I want to take, what, what I want you to take home with you is that the general theory of relativity, you know, which is a theory of the fabric of space-time, is an experimentally good framework to discuss <coughs> phenomenon all the way up till here. And uh, in particular, it, uh, it uh, discusses, uh, it's a framework to discuss this. Uh, this is a measurement, okay? It's a measurement. All right, so that much for general theory of relativity. My God, I'm running out of time. So now, now we come to, uh, okay, so this much for Newton, Maxwell, Einstein, general theory of relativity, and cosmology. Oh, yes, thank you very much. So this is what it is. So this ball was presented to me by Professor Lyman Page, who is uh, one of the chief scientists of this uh, WMAP experiment. And this is, this is what they observe. And this is the truth, he said. I have seen the birth of the universe, and that's true. Here. Okay, thanks. All right, so now our story changes. And this, of course, is... Uh, in my opinion, one of the, this is one of the greatest revolutions of uh, science ever, actually, because it changes the entire way in which the world really works. You don't see it, that's the problem. But it really works because of quantum mechanics. So what is it? Well, I can tell you that all the electronics you use, all the computers that work, I mean, 67% of the economy of the United States depends upon the fact that Quantum mechanics is the right theory of nature in the microscopic. I mean, all of modern technology really, this number I read somewhere actually, but that's not important. I just wanted to impress upon you that most of modern life is actually controlled by the laws of nature, which are not classical, but which are quantum mechanical. Now, what is quantum mechanics? So in a nutshell, I'll tell you what that is. Okay, so quantum mechanics deals with the laws of motion at the microscopic level, okay? We want to describe an electron or an atom. An atom is something like 10 to the minus 8 uh, centimeters small, okay? Something like that. Or uh, even if you go below it, nuclei, the stuff within nuclei, Newton's theory, Einstein's theory <coughs> don't work. What you need is a new mechanics, and this mechanics was discovered by a whole series of uh, um, experiments and uh, by lots of people involved. It was not discovered like Einstein discovered general relativity, but uh, by lots of people. And finally, by uh, the, uh, the uh, people like Heisenberg, Schrodinger, and Dirac. I mean. Okay, now this is a good theory. Why is it a good theory? Because it is tested to one part in 10 to the 18 meters. It is, it is experimentally tested in this high energy physics laboratories. This is the correct theory. Right to that distance, okay? This is an important point. And uh, I just have a little cartoon to tell you what quantum mechanics is. I'm supposed to give a lecture to tell you what is quantum mechanics. How do I do that? So I just found two things on the web which I put together. So you see, this is what Newton's mechanics will tell you. If you have some uh, nucleus of an atom, and you have electrons, you'll have orbits around them. Okay? This is wrong picture, this is not right. It's completely wrong. <laughs> what is the correct picture? And these are actually measurements, is that the electrons actually look fuzzy. You know, they, they, there is an uncertainty in where you can put it or place it. And this fuzziness is the hallmark of quantum mechanics. Right? It's all of molecular chemistry, all of the recognition of molecules by themselves, the, the disassociation of, uh, the, you know, the uh, chemistry that controls your uh, proteins, your DNA, everything. All of it, all of that stuff actually depends on this mechanics actually. Okay, so this is the heart of the issue really. And the view of the world is totally different uh, if you really think about it very carefully. Okay, so this is my... Uh, little uh, slide on quantum mechanics and this is a slide on the validity of quantum mechanics. We discussed the validity of general relativity, right? In such detail.